Portrait of an African elephant called Boadicea, taken at terrifyingly close quarters. A man apparently risks his life to capture shots of an elephant in full threat charge. A woman takes the same kind of risks to get a close-up of a charging bull. No one who values his life should try to approach elephants on foot in this way. This is not just a photographer's study. It's part of a five-year scientific study that depends on taking identification pictures of almost every elephant in Lake Manyara National Park, Tanzania. The scientist, a young Scot called Ian Douglas Hamilton, was set the problem of finding out how 500 elephants could live confined within the park without destroying their environment. For identification purposes, he needed shots of every elephant with ears extended, a position adopted in threat charge. In time, some individuals got so used to him that they couldn't always be persuaded to charge for their portraits. The subjects of some portraits he is never likely to forget. On the left is Tyrone No. 1, who masterminded an attack on my Land Rover, 1967. Standing next to her, Tyrone No. 2, overturned a vehicle in 1970. On the right is Tyrone No. 4, who was shot by a ranger in self-defense at the last minute. And this, one of the worst, is Tyrone No. 3. elephant like Tyrone number three is only one of the hazards to be faced when you and your family decide to live with wild African elephants. Good evening. This is David Niven. Join me and Ian Douglas Hamilton's camp at Lake Manyara, a national park with a big problem. The Manyara problem, in a nutshell, can be summarized by saying that there are too many elephants in too small a space. Over the last 50 years, they've steadily been pushed inwards to the one remaining safe area. Even one elephant is destructive, but when you pack a great many into a small area, you're bound to have problems. His wife, Aurea, a fashion designer turned photographer, shared the dangers and the rewards of his long study. She bore his first daughter, Saba, during the time they worked together in Manyara Park. His thesis, as thick as a telephone directory, has not only won scientific acclaim, it has added substantially to man's knowledge of African elephants and the way they live. More important, how they can continue to live in this wild and beautiful place. Lake Manyara National Park lies in the Rift Valley of Tanzania, beneath the steep wall of the rift to the west and the lake itself to the east. The park stretches for 30 miles along the lake shore. At its northern end, it is bordered by banana plantations and a village called Matwembu. In the south, there are farms too. Until recently, all this cultivation was part of the elephant's range. Now its closeness poses one of the main problems. The elephants are tempted to break out and go crop raiding. Lake Manyara Park is incredibly fertile, thanks to the streams that run down the rift. Nowhere is it more than four miles wide. In places, the buttresses of the rift wall stretch down to the lake shore. Despite its fertility, there is not much room or food to spare for a population of over 500 elephants, together with thousands of other animals. At its highest points, the rift wall climbs vertically above the park for over a thousand feet. On top of this escarpment, at the southern end, stretches 90 square miles of the Morang Forest, 
At present, this lies outside the park boundaries. Before he could begin to live with elephants, Douglas Hamilton had to learn to survive among them. The Tanzania parks gave him one of their best rangers, Mahoja Berengo. Ian's qualifications were purely academic. An Oxford zoological graduate with a research grant from the New York Zoological Society and the Royal Society London. They don't teach you to track elephants at Oxford. Mahoja was his tutor now. When it came to trees and the damage done to them by elephants, the roles of pupil and teacher were reversed. Destruction of Manyara's acacia woodlands was both the starting point and reason for Ian Douglas Hamilton's research. This acacia will die. It has been severely ring-barked by elephants. The damage is typical of that inflicted by a confined elephant population. The tree they damage most is the flat-topped acacia tortillas. By killing the trees, the elephants deprive themselves not only of food, but of shade essential to their calves. If the present trend continues, the acacia woodlands of Manyara will be wiped out, and if this happens, the elephant population may easily suffer a fatal decline. When hundreds are concentrated unnaturally by man, the destruction has to be seen to be believed. When they're finished, the forest looks like a junkyard. This is the wreck of a fever tree, another species of acacia. It isn't always the tree itself they're after. In the dry season, they shake the acacias to release a golden rain of seed pods. Having shaken, they pick up acacia pods with an exquisite delicacy. For once, the elephants are doing acacia tortillas a good turn. The seeds only have a chance of germinating when carried well away from the parent tree. The elephants act as the dispersal agent. A single dropping can contain 10,000 seeds. Apart from its qualities as compost, the dropping protects them from seed-eating insects. So elephants were actually replacing some of the trees they had destroyed. When space for wild animals was limitless, regrowth kept the woodlands in balance. But there are far too many hungry mouths now for this to work anymore. A key shoot has been nipped off this seedling.
A young acacia has got a start in life only to lose a branch. If the elephants of Manyara were not to be reduced by shooting, answers to the acacia problem had to be found. Finding them was hard and often dangerous work, but there were marvellous compensations. The Douglas Hamiltons spent their first years together in this idyllic place. If Eden had been filled with elephants, lions and buffalo, this could well have been its location. Sometimes the other inhabitants were not uh, entirely welcoming. The unprovoked charge of an aged buffalo bull was more the sort of behaviour to be expected from a huge and unpredictable black rhino, a species for which Ian had developed a healthy regard. Early on in his work, he had been charged and trampled by one and suffered severe spinal damage. This one had a bad sore on its flank, which might have made the creature likely to charge on sight. However, in a Land Rover, you're fairly safe from rhinos, if um, not from elephants. Such encounters were light relief from the day in, day out task of photographing identifying and building up of a personal file on Manyara's elephants. Ian worked mostly with females and young. He found that cows and calves lived in stable family groups, separately from the bulls. He worked on one family group at a time, recording individual characteristics and relationships. His wife, Aurea, born of Italian and French parents, was brought up on a farm in Kenya. But this was her first experience of a really close contact with these highly alarming animals. I'd never lived closely with elephants before, and especially observing them. I, I was frightened. It, it was a very frightening experience to be in front of a charging elephant. And I couldn't understand why Ian was so confident always when he went right up to the elephants. But then, as time went on, I did realize that he knew every single elephant individually in the park, and this, of course, made a difference. Ian built up his identification system by noting such details as tusk shapes and even notches in ears. Taking the families one by one, I gradually built up a personal dossier on almost every single one of Manyara's elephants. Within this dossier, I kept the pictures of each and a record of their life history for the period over which I observed it. For a while I gave them all numbers, but then I found that names were much easier to remember. And I based them sometimes on a notable physical characteristic, but more often I took a historical character. Whatever names he gave them, Boadicea, Ariadne, or perhaps One Tusk, he regarded each one with an almost proprietary affection. And after a long, hot, often dangerous day, Eden was always waiting. So Saba was born, and just a year later, Dudu, which means insect. Almost from the beginning, the children accompanied their parents and came to accept elephants and their young as something that behaved rather like their own family. 
The great creatures their father studied were certainly nothing to be afraid of, provided you respected them. It's gone. And during the drive back to camp, at the end of the day, there was no telling what the children might see. Perhaps herds of golden leaping impala, made more golden by the evening light. Or something you'd never expect to find up in the branches of a dead acacia tree. Three lions in a tree. That's not much to get excited about. At least, not if like Saba and Dudu, you've lived all your days in Lake Manyara Park. Their home all this time had a certain desert island simplicity. Ian had designed it and built it with the park's approval and with money from his grant. Built from local stone, timber and reeds, it commanded an ideal outlook from which to observe elephants. Their home overlooked the bed of the Endala River, where elephants often come to drink and bathe, and not only elephants. I think that as a mother, observing elephants, I've become much more aware of the importance of tactile care because baby elephants were well looked after. Uh, they were, they always had a, a young female who would touch them, uh, put their trunks around them. Babies could rub up against another animal's leg. It was this special tactile care that I was trying to relate to the way I brought up my children. Because this, I thought, was important, just as important as it is for elephants to live close to each other. It was important for us to live close to each other. And I tried to use this system with my children. By touching them, I felt I could give them reassurance. And then, of course, whenever there was a bad moment, I tried to hold on to them. And I'm sure this must have given them a feeling of security. For the next stage in his research, Ian needed to know the exact age of individuals. There is a direct relationship between shoulder height and age. First, he took the elephant's photograph. Then the dauntless Mahaja walked out with a measuring rod and placed it in the elephant's footprint. Ian took a second picture so that he could compare the two and read off the height of the elephant that had stood there. The method only worked well where single elephants, usually bulls, had left a clear-cut footprint. 
So he invented a more complicated device. It was all done by mirrors and a prism. It produced a double image on film. Then by calculating displacement between the images, he could work out height at the shoulder. This is Virgo, height seven foot three, age 20 to 25. He applied the method to most of the cars he had already identified. And in this way, he gained vital information about the age structure of the population. He discovered that though Manyara has the highest elephant density in Africa, it also has a healthy breeding rate with a large proportion of young. But for how long if the elephants continued to destroy the woodlands? This was the main problem still to be solved. To crack this problem, he had to understand the innermost workings of elephant society, one totally governed by the matriarchs. This is Boadicea, the most imposing matriarch in Manyara, leader of the largest family unit of 22 animals. She specializes in terrifying threat charges that are usually bluff. Not only do all the younger females look to her for leadership, but two other family units follow hers at a distance. Together they form a kinship group. One of the best ways of approaching Bodice here without disturbing her was to climb a tree while her family enjoyed their midday siesta. Each mother stands in the shade with her calves. On the left, Diana with broken tip to tusk. Next, Virgo with one tusk. Ian developed a specially close relationship with her. Then comes Calypso, a young cow who already has two calves. The next giant in the lineup is a senior cow, Right Hook. And on the right flank, ever watchful, the great bird is here herself. A little way off, a young bull stands alone learning the hard lesson that he will soon be driven away from the family circle forever. Matriarchal concern for family safety is vividly demonstrated when the senior cows sense a threat, perhaps from man or possibly from predators, endangering their calves. They form a furious defensive circle. It's extremely alarming, as it's intended to be. This group is led by Catherine the Great, an elephant with unequal ivory. Helen, a senior cow, screams and demonstrates to back her up. Only when they judge the threat is past do they calm down, and Catherine leads them away to thicker cover. The deeper Ian went into the social life of Manyara's elephants, the more integrated he found it to be. Obviously all the elephants in Manyara knew each other frightfully well, because they mixed together. And even when two separate family units came near to each other, the youngsters often run across and intermingle. There was no territoriality or aggression between family units. They seemed to, well, really just love each other very much. Now, one of the things I hated doing was the necessary disturbance that was caused by my photographing. And I liked best of all to be able to watch elephants without disturbing them, to approach them from downwind so that they weren't even aware of my presence, and to be able to record their behavior and at the end of it go away and they didn't know that anybody had been watching them at all. On several occasions, Ian Douglas Hamilton came across the bones of dead elephants which had been shot. There's an old hunter's tale about the graveyard where elephants go to die, where rich hordes of ivory lie for the picking up. Well, this was no elephant's graveyard, just the result of a local massacre by poachers. But the elephant behavior Ian now witnessed 
was as strange as any hunter's story. The elephants showed an extraordinary curiosity about the remains of their dead companions. They sniffed and touched the bones, almost as if trying to identify to whom they belonged in life. Next, they carried them short distances, even placing the bones in their mouths. The tusks excited special interest, perhaps because they were the only bits recognizable from life. Eventually, they all picked up bones, large and small, and carried them away, sometimes a hundred yards or more, before dropping them in the bush. Whatever the explanation, there is no doubt that the bones of dead elephants have a special significance for the living animal. Elephants totally ignore the bones of other species. It wasn't the first time this bone scattering had been observed. Elephants had previously been seen actually to bury bones. Ian Douglas Hamilton confesses that he has no satisfactory explanation for it, nor as yet has any other scientist. But the keys to his research were to be found among the living elephant families. One major discovery was how different is the life of male and female calves. At first, they're both equally protected. They're even woken up when necessary and reassured by a trunk placed in the baby's mouth. Often it is the teenage females of the family who perform these nursery duties. The babies suckle from any nursing mother in the group. That's a young teenager in attendance on the right. Later, when she becomes a mother, she'll benefit from her experience as a nanny. When dealing with the more aggressive bull children, teenage nannies need a good deal more patience. When the family is on the move, it's usually the teenage female who restrains the youngster's urge to rush ahead. As in many human families, the indiscretions of the very young are usually tolerated. A large bull, temporarily associating with a female member of the group, allows a very small calf to greet him, even though they're competing for a drink. Discipline has to be taught, however, when another young calf spoils his mother's water hole, she gently pushes him out. He doesn't give up easily, though, and sneaks back to turn the whole thing into a mud pie. He receives his due reward eventually by getting sand up his trunk. The young bull's story is quite different from the cow's. From the earliest age, he tries out charges at everything and everybody. In this case, he's practicing on the Douglas Hamilton's Land Rover. As they grow older, the young bulls have to be put more firmly in place. A mother tells her bull calf he's definitely not wanted at her water hole. Eventually, she has to hold him off at trunk's length. When they're slightly older, the young bulls will flex their muscles at other targets, like an inoffensive herd of impala. It's all show off in the typical manner of young males everywhere.
play fighting among young bulls starts from an early age. Here, the youngest of the three is trying to stir things up and gets chased off. A matriarch intervenes and tells the boys to cool it. Her calf places his trunk in her mouth as an appeasement gesture. Soon, inevitably, sex comes on the scene. The young males become prematurely interested in the female calves, even their sisters. They're beginning to become a thorough nuisance in the family. When he's about 13, at the age of puberty, the matriarchs decide they've had enough. It's time he left the family unit. Here's the driving out process in action. A matriarch turns on a bull and persuades him he's not wanted. A series of such attacks gradually drives him further away, though he'll stay within half a mile of the family for several years. Eviction probably reduces the chances of inbreeding. Some play fights are particularly vicious, especially when they're between two young bulls who have not yet fixed their position in the hierarchy. However, these fights are vital to bull society. On their outcome depends priority at water holes and sexual acceptance among the cow groups. In these battles, the clash of ivory can often be heard far off. Their value is that once a bull's place is established, he's unlikely to challenge a much stronger animal and get badly hurt. This youngster is very conscious of his lack of status. He feels insecure among a group of older bulls and takes his branch well away before he dares to eat it. From now on, the bull mingles with other males, young and old, in loose-knit groups that constantly change their composition. Sometimes he lives quite alone. He's now all set for a bachelor life. Only when he's grown big enough will he have sufficient standing to mix with the cow groups again. A huge bull greets and is accepted by a matriarch. In the mating season, he may follow a female on heat, but even this association is short-lived. This separate life lived by the bulls was the key to Ian's next piece of research, finding out how family groups moved over a long period. The plan was to place radio transmitters on selected bulls. Mahoja had to carry a rifle by park safety regulations, but the gun Ian used only fired an anaesthetic dart. As the dart hits, Ian notes the time so that he can judge when the drug will have taken full effect. The first bull he darted was a mature one. Having no strong social bonds with any family, it was unlikely that other elephants would rush to his defense. This was largely a trial run to put the first radio transmitter in place and see how it worked. As soon as the bull was fully immobilized, Ian and Mahoja moved in to attach the radio transmitter. But first they had to cool the drugged elephant with water. An elephant fans itself with its ears. These and other parts of its cooling system were now anaesthetized and out of action. The transmitter was attached to a length of machine drive belting like that used in factories, so strong that even an elephant would have trouble in breaking it. A great deal had to be done in a very short time. Quite apart from the danger of overheating, there was the weight of the collapsed animal on his lungs and ribs to be considered. The effect of bright sunlight too on dilated pupils, though fortunately this elephant had gone down in a fairly shady spot. The, 
There was a lot of information to be recorded that is impossible to get when the animal is fully active. Samples of parasites to be taken. And all this to be done within a maximum of 20 minutes. After that, it was essential to give the antidote that would bring the elephant round no worse for its experience. Now the bull was free to continue his wanderings, sending out a bleep bleep signal that could be picked up on a tracking aerial at a range of 30 miles. Flying his own aircraft from a bush strip near his camp, Ian radio tracks not only that first mature bull, but a series of young bulls still loosely attached to their families. The bleep bleep picked up by the antennae on his wing struts enabled him to plot the seasonal movements of selected family units for up to five months at a time. At the end of the experiment, he had an accurate picture of how individual groups moved in search of food throughout the year. Most important of all, he had learned how much they depended on the meringue forest on top of the southern escarpment during the dry season. Unfortunately, the routes to this were largely blocked by farmlands to the south of the park. Radio tracking on foot also showed how much the elephants used the dense forest at the northern end, close to the banana plantations and Matwambu. If they crossed the frontier into the banana shambles, they could be legally shot as raiders. So, the north end of the park had to be closed to elephants, and if at all possible, the southern end opened. Often in the dense forest, they walked into elephants other than the radio bull they were tracking. First-hand observation, as well as radio tracking, made it clear that so many elephants used this forest that anti-banana raiding measures were a top priority. Bananas are a favourite elephant delicacy. Ian's answer came straight from previous farming experience. If domestic cows could be kept in with an electric fence, why not elephants? There was only one way to find out. He put up a trial fence. The first elephant touched it, got a mild shock, and then the matriarch went screaming mad. The trial electric fence didn't last long, but elephants are quick to learn from unpleasant experiences. Today, there's a strong three-strand electric fence along the border between plantations and the forest frontier of the park. The elephants respect this, and senior warden Benjamin Kanza regards it as something approaching a complete answer. Before the fence was put on, there was a lot of uh, crop raiding, especially by elephants. But now that uh, the fence is on, this is reduced to quite tremendously. 
When we put in the fence first, there were lots of breakages because the animals were not um, aware then that there was, a, there was a fence. But we kept on trying and mending, trying and mending, we putting a lot of people on the fence. And eventually, we are, we are getting uh, success, although not, you know, sort of perfection. Data about as many groups as possible was still needed to fill in the picture of seasonal movements. Ian had only two transmitters, so he had to retrieve them from bulls who had served their purpose and transfer them to other mobile elephant radio stations. It was when he decided to get his radio back from a young bull attached to Sarah's group that the trouble started. As he had anticipated, the bull seemed to be a safe distance from Sarah's family. The dart struck home, and he began to go groggy. The bull trumpeted an alarm. All at once, the bush was full of angry matriarchs, led by Sarah standing tall and sighting Ian over her crossed tusks. Ian now knew that he was in bad trouble, though it wasn't himself he was worried about. If the bull was not to suffer damage, he had to get the antidote into him in a very few minutes. Unfortunately, he didn't have another dart available to do the job. He never expected to have to use one. With the matriarchs on the warpath, he had no illusions now about recovering his radio. Then the unbelievable happened. The senior cows of Sarah's group tried to raise the drugged two-ton bull to his feet. Lacking a dart to deliver the vital antidote, there was only one thing to do, to try to inject it by hand. When that failed, to get in close with the Land Rover was the only hope. The needle went home, and so did Sarah's crossed tusks. <laughs> Having, as she thought, killed her enemy, she backed off to tend the bull who was partly coming round. She seemed to think the danger was over. At least she withdrew, leaving the bull on the ground. Not to mention her dead and crumpled enemy. But Ian wasn't satisfied yet. 
To make sure of the bull's recovery, he went back on foot and injected the rest of the antidote, knowing for certain that Sarah was somewhere close at hand. During his five years of living with elephants, Ian Douglas Hamilton has taken risks which some wildlife experts and scientists consider unnecessarily foolhardy. Certainly he has a most extraordinary understanding of elephants and a rapport with them which no one should try to imitate. They will probably get killed if they do. This rapport is typified by his relationship with the one tusked cow of Boadicea's group called Virgo. Virgo remembered him when he returned to Manyara after two years at Oxford writing his thesis. She often greets him by putting her trunk in his hand. He is always deeply moved by this in a way that isn't strictly scientific. With complete trust, Virgo sometimes greets him and then brings the younger of her two calves to do the same. Some see these as acts of bravado, but Ian claims that he can predict Virgo's exact behavior. Bravado or not, such demonstrations in no way detract from the solid achievements of his research. Perhaps the most significant single fact his study has revealed is how urgently the elephants need access to the additional food in the meringue forest, especially when the park below is dried up before the rains. He and Mahoja often followed elephants along perilous mountain tracks, more suited to the agility of baboons. Once, they even found a cow who had missed her footing and crashed 400 feet to her death. Not even the extraordinary ribbed and rubbery formation of an elephant's foot could defeat the steepness of this particular trail. Research into family structure and movement had now made it clear that if the Manyara herds and their environment are to survive, they need to be able to climb freely up out of the park to the Meringue Forest. The timber there is so lush and plentiful that an influx of elephants in the dry season can do it no appreciable damage. Unfortunately, the easiest approaches to the meringue forest lie across the farmlands to the south of the park. At present, if they cross those farms, they can be, and often are, shot as crop raiders. In 1955, when these farming concessions were given, many conservationists argued that farms could never coexist with 500 elephants as next door neighbors. And so it has turned out. Douglas Hamilton has strongly urged that the Tanzania National Parks buy back these farms and compensate the farmers. The money is being raised and the farmers seem willing to make a deal. If it comes off, not only will the elephants have regained safe migration routes to the meringue forest, but the present size of the park will have been nearly doubled. So the bush may soon creep in and the area once again become elephant country. For once, wild animals will have won. But alas, the issue is by no means decided yet. The Douglas Hamiltons fervently hope their arguments will be accepted. If the farmland can be added, it seems unlikely that there will be any need in the foreseeable future to control the Manyara elephants by shooting. Ironically, Ian's study of closely knit elephant society has confirmed one sad fact. If it ever comes to culling, the polite word for killing, there is only one way to minimize the distress among an overstocked population. This is to obliterate whole families rather than shoot individual adult elephants whose loss would leave many groups completely leaderless. As a scientist, 
Ian Douglas Hamilton accepts that culling has already been judged necessary in other African national parks. But as a man who loves elephants, he can only pray that it won't happen to his beloved Manyara herds. He and his family have lived far too closely with wild African elephants for him ever to feel totally detached. This is David Niven. Good night. The world of survival has arrived on video. This award-winning series of wildlife films is now available on a series of video cassettes. <laughs> 